Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov was very much aware of the work of E.L. Thorndike and referred to it a number of times in his writings and his lectures. Likewise, Thorndike was aware of Pavlov's work. There was some overlap between the two, but essentially the two men traveled two different paths. In a sense, they were both a beginning point. Thorndike can be considered the creator of instrumental conditioning and Pavlov the creator of classical conditioning. For Thorndike, the essential experimental paradigm in all his work was the paradigm generated by the animal's performance in the puzzle box. And for Pavlov, the essential paradigm for all of his theorizing came from the classical conditioning paradigm that we will be discussing in a moment. It is important to note that there are, are a few major differences between instrumental and classical conditioning. Another term for instrumental conditioning would be active conditioning because it necessitates some response on the part of the organism in order to bring about the reward or reinforcement. In other words, the animal must act in such a way as to bring about the reward. His behavior is responsible for the reward occurring. If he doesn't perform the right response, he would not receive reward. This is why it is called instrumental conditioning, because the response is instrumental in bringing about the reward. In the case of the cat in the puzzle box, the cat had to learn the appropriate response which released him from the confined quarters. Classical conditioning, on the other hand, can be referred to as passive conditioning because classical conditioning does not depend upon the animal responding in a certain way. It depends more on the experimental arrangement, which we are going to describe below. These are basic differences between instrumental and classical conditioning. But even with these differences, there are a number of things in common. Both kinds of conditioning, in a sense, can be considered a language in that both allow the researcher to communicate with the animal in a way that otherwise would be impossible. A cat in a Skinner box through instrumental conditioning and the laws that govern it is telling the researcher something about how the laws of learning apply to the cat. This is also true of classical conditioning. Classical conditioning allows the animal to tell the experimenter what sorts of stimuli he is capable of responding to, under what conditions he responds to one stimulus and under what conditions he responds to another, what effects drugs may have on him, and so forth. Turning to the basic classical conditioning paradigm, it involves the following things. First of all, there is an unconditioned stimulus symbolized UCS. There is an unconditioned response symbolized UCR. The third ingredient is the conditioned stimulus symbolized CS. When all these things are put together in the proper way, a conditioned response develops, which is symbolized CR. The way these ingredients are arranged to bring about classical conditioning is to first present a neutral stimulus, a stimulus which when presented to the organism does not elicit a response. This is the conditioned stimulus. Following the presentation of the conditioned stimulus, the unconditioned stimulus is presented. The unconditioned stimulus does el elicit or cause a natural response from the organism. Every unconditioned stimulus causes a natural response on the part of the organism to it. And that natural automatic response to the unconditioned stimulus is what we call the unconditioned response. For example, if you stick a person with a pin, the person will withdraw that portion of his or, or her body being stuck with the pin there will be an avoidance response, a tendency to move away from the source of pain. In this case, the unconditioned stimulus is the pain, and the unconditioned response is the avoidance. Another example, one that Pavlov used, was food powder given to a hungry dog. When food powder is presented to a hungry dog, the dog will salivate. In this case, the food powder is the unconditioned stimulus, and salivation is the unconditioned response. When these things are arranged so that the neutral stimulus, or the CS, is followed by the unconditioned stimulus, gradually, through a number of pairings, the previously neutral stimulus, the CS, will develop the capability of causing or eliciting the same kind of response that was previously caused only by the unconditioned stimulus. When this happens, classical conditioning is said to have occurred. 
the relationship between the unconditioned response and the conditioned response is that they're always the same response. For example, if the unconditioned response were salivation, then the conditioned response would also be salivation. But the magnitude of the conditioned response, when compared to the unconditioned response, is always less. It is never quite as great as the unconditioned response. The next experimental arrangement after bringing about a conditioned response is often designed to eliminate the conditioned response. What one does is simply to remove the ingredient from the classical conditioning paradigm that holds the whole thing together and that one element upon which the whole procedure depends is the unconditioned stimulus. This is why Pavlov called the unconditioned stimulus a reinforcer, because it reinforced the conditioned response. So in order to remove a conditioned response, one removes the unconditioned stimulus. During training, you will remember, the conditioned stimulus was always followed by the unconditioned stimulus. Now, when we are attempting to get rid of the conditioned response, we present the conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus. We do this a number of times and gradually the magnitude of the conditioned response will become less and less and eventually when the conditioned stimulus is presented to the organism there will be no conditioned response. When this occurs we say experimental extinction has taken place. The conditioned response we say has been extinguished. After extinction has taken place Another interesting phenomenon occurs. Let's say that you take the animal out of the apparatus following extinction and return, return him to his home cage. Here he is just allowed to live for one day without receiving any further training. The next day when he is placed back in the apparatus and you again present the conditioned stimulus, the same conditioned stimulus that was extinguished the day before, there will be another burst of conditioned responses the return of the conditioned response following arrest after the first extinction session is referred to as spontaneous recovery. Now let's go back to the original classical conditioning experiment where we have a unconditioned stimulus preceded by a conditioned stimulus and eventually through these pairings we obtain a conditioned response. Now let's label this particular conditioned stimulus, the first one we use, CS1. Let's say, for example, it's a blinking light. It is the one that we have paired with the UCS. Let's say, for example, the UCS is food powder and the UCR is salivation. The condition response, of course, would also be salivation. Now we have reached the point in our experiment where the blinking light causes the animal to saliv salivate without presenting the food powder. Next, let's take another neutral stimulus, which we will call CS2 and we will pair it with CS1 in the same way as we paired CS1 with the food powder. At this point however food powder is no longer part of the experiment. We are merely pairing CS2 which we will say is a buzzer with CS1 which is a blinking light. The way we pair them is to precede CS1 with CS2 first the buzzer and then the blinking light. Remember that CS1 has already developed the capability of causing salivation. Through this pairing of the buzzer and the blinking light, eventually the second neutral stimulus also develops the capacity of causing salivation. We refer to this as higher order conditioning. In higher order conditioning, the first con conditioned stimulus, CS1, acts much like an unconditioned stimulus. Apparently this procedure can be repeated one more time. In other words, we can now take CS2 and pair it with a third conditioned stimulus, CS3, and it is possible that the third previously neutral stimulus will also come to cause the animal to salivate. In this case, when a third neutral stimulus is used, it is called third order conditioning. The second step that we just referred to where we paired the buzzer with the blinking light was second order conditioning. Both second order and third order conditioning are examples of higher order conditioning. Few people, if any, 
have had any success in going higher than third order conditioning. For the next example of what happens in a classical conditioning paradigm, let's again return to the basic procedure where we pair a CS with a UCS. Only in this particular case, let's have as our conditioned stimulus a 2000 cycle per second tone. Again, we will have the UCS be food powder for a hungry animal. We pair the tone with food and eventually the tone alone causes the animal to salivate. But this time we're going to do things a little bit differently. This time after we have brought about the conditioning, we will present the tone to the animal and determine the magnitude of the condition response given to it. We will present the tone and measure drops of saliva. Drops of saliva will determine the magnitude of the conditioned response. The more drops, the greater the conditioned response. In addition to presenting the 2000 cycle per second tone, we will also present tones with a higher frequency and tones with a lower frequency. We will present tones, for example, of 500 cycles per second, 3000 cycles per second, 1500 cycles per second, 1000 cycles per second, and so forth. What we find is that we get a conditioned response not only to the exact conditioned stimulus that we had paired with the UCS, but we also get a conditioned response to other stimuli which are similar to the conditioned stimulus. In other words, we will get a conditioned response to the tone of 2500 cycles per second, 100 cycles per second, and many other tones, although the 2000 cycle per second tone was our conditioned stimulus. However, the magnitude of the conditioned response to these other tones will be less. The magnitude of the conditioned response given to these other tones will be determined by their similarity to the original condition stimulus, which was 2000 cycles per second. As the similarity goes down, so does the magnitude of the conditioned response. If a graph is made of this information, you would show the different frequencies along the baseline or x-axis, and along the y-axis you would have the magnitude of the conditioned response. The graph would show the greatest condition response to the 2000 cycle per second tone with diminishing magnitudes of conditioned responses on both sides of that tone. This is referred to as the stimulus generalization gradient. In general, the tendency to give condition responses to stimuli other than those actually involved in the learning experience is referred to as generalization. Pavlov's explanation for generalization was that the information travels from the sense receptors, in this case from the ear, to some area of the cortex where there was a specific area that was stimulated by the 2000 cycle per second tone. He felt that other tones similar to, to the 2000 cycle per second one had their localization near the 2000 cycle per second tone area in the brain and the excitation caused by stimulation in this area seeped out or spilled over into neighboring regions of that part of the cortex. The seeping out or spilling over of excitation Pavlov called irradiation. Irradiation was for, for Pavlov the anatomical or physiological basis for generalization. The opposite of generalization is discrimination. Discrimination comes about when an organism learns to respond to one stimulus and not to others, although the others may be similar to the first. This can be developed by introducing two tones during training and differentially rewarding one but not the other. For example, you can present a 2000 cycle per second tone and it's always followed by food powder. You present a 2500 cycle per second tone and it is never followed by food powder. Under these conditions, the animal will learn to respond only to the 2000 cycle per second tone, and he will inhibit the response to the 2500 cycle per second tone. Of course, more than two tones can be used during training. At the cortical level, Pavlov explained discrimination by saying that activity in the brain area corresponding to the 2500 cycle per second tone would be inhibited 
and at the same time there is, is excitation in the area of the brain corresponding to the 2000 cycle per second tone. As a result, excitation becomes specific to the area corresponding to the 2000 cycle per second tone and there is an inhibition that occurs in the area corresponding to the 2500 cycle per second tone. When these two processes have both been developed, reciprocal induction is said to have occurred. This was Pavlov's explanation for discrimination. That is, the processes of both excitation and inhibition combine in the cortex. How we respond to the environment at any given time, according to Pavlov, depends upon the matrix of areas of excitation and inhibition that characterize the cortex at that moment. Some stimuli will tend to inhibit cortical activity, others will tend to excite the cortical area, and all of these different areas acting together determine how we respond to the environment. If a stimulus has been followed by an unconditioned stimulus a large number of times, in other words, when conditioning is very strong, the corresponding area of the brain develops what Pavlov called a dynamic stereotype. When this happens, the reaction to the stimulus occurs with ease. The result is what we would roughly call a habit today. Before we go further, it might be interesting to note that the person considered to be the founder of American behaviorism, J.B. Watson, was strongly influenced by the writings of Pavlov. He was influenced by the conditioned reflex idea, and in one of his studies he attempted to show how it was related to emotional development. Watson and his co-workers took a little 10-month-old infant named El Albert and gave him a white rat to play with. Apparently, Albert was very responsive to the rat, and he enjoyed playing with it. As Albert was playing with the rat, the experimenters came up behind him and made a loud noise, which startled Albert, and he threw the rat away. But after a short while, he was playing with it again, and as he played with it, the experimenter came up behind him again and made another loud noise. They continued to do this until Albert wouldn't have anything to do with the rat. Not only did he not like the rat, but that night when they brought Albert to a hospital for observation, they tried to get him into bed, and he raised quite a fuss. A nurse came to his aid, and again he raised quite a fuss, because, of course, the sheets on the bed were white, and the nurse's uniform was white. From this example, we can see a number of the ingredients of classical conditioning. We can see, for example, that the white rat was neutral to Albert. At least it didn't cause him to respond adversely. So the white rat was the conditioned stimulus. The loud noise was the unconditioned stimulus, and the avoidance response that followed the noise was the unconditioned response. Gradually, the white rat elicited the same kind of response. The fact that Albert also responded negatively to white things like sheets and nurses' uniforms exemplifies generalization. According to Watson, this is how all of our emotions develop. Incidentally, Aldous Huxley borrowed this experiment from Watson for his novel The Brave New World. It is interesting to speculate on Albert as an adult and his attitude toward white things. He, he may grow up being mildly apprehensive about white things, and because he was only 10 months of age, the origin of this apprehension would not be known to him. The experimenter may know it, others may know it, but unless Albert was specifically told why he may have that strange feeling about white, he himself would not know. This is how the behaviorists feel our emotions develop. They feel our emotions develop through classical conditioning at a time too early in our lives for us to remember. 
Pavlov and others have talked about different types of classical conditioning. We were talking about the basic general paradigm for classical conditioning, but there are a number of different arrangements. One type of classical conditioning is called simultaneous conditioning. This is where the conditioned stimulus comes on five seconds or less before the unconditioned stimulus, and the conditioned stimulus goes off when the unconditioned stimulus comes on. Once again, in simultaneous conditioning, the conditioned stimulus comes on five seconds or less before the UCS and terminates when the UCS comes on. A second kind of classical conditioning is called delayed conditioning. This is when the conditioned stimulus comes on five seconds or more before the UCS and terminates when the UCS comes on. A third variation is called short trace conditioning, which involves a time lapse between when the CS goes off and when the UCS comes on. With short trace conditioning, the gap of time between when the CS goes off and the UCS goes on is less than a minute. In another kind of conditioning, long trace conditioning, the gap of time between when the CS goes off and the UCS goes on is a minute or more. A fifth possibility is to have the conditioned stimulus come on after the unconditioned stimulus. This is referred to as backward conditioning. Backward conditioning is very difficult, if not impossible, to establish. More experimenters than not claim that it simply does not exist. Again, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to bring about conditioning when the conditioned stimulus comes on after the unconditioned stimulus does. The last variation in the classical conditioning paradigm is to have a time interval act as the conditioned stimulus. In this case, there is no stimulus as such that acts as a conditioned stimulus. Instead, what the experimenter does is to present the conditioned stimulus at set intervals like one every two minutes. Gradually what happens is that the time interval comes to act as a conditioned stimulus. In other words, at the end of a certain interval, where the UCS would ordinarily occur, a condition response occurs. This is called temporal conditioning. Pavlov was a very objective, close to the data scientist. He had hard words toward the end of his life for the cognitive or gestalt theorists in America. He thought they were too subjective in using words like insight learning. He felt that anything they referred to as in insightful learning could be explained using classical conditioning terminology, and he preferred the less subjective explanations for learning phenomena. There are recent experiments, however, that indicate that although Pavlov's work was objective, factual, and close to the data, classical conditioning may involve phenomena of a subjective nature. As an example, let's look at two experiments done by Egger and Miller. One experiment was done in 1962 and the other was done in 1963. What he did was to take the classical conditioning paradigm, as we have been talking about it up until this point, and made two variations in it. In one case, they arranged the situation so that there were two conditioned stimuli and they overlapped each other. First, CS1 came on and sometime after CS1 came on, CS2 came on, and they were both followed by the unconditioned stimulus. Both CS1 and CS2 terminated as the unconditioned stimulus came on. Both CS1 and CS2 are arranged in accordance with the principle of classical conditioning, and both should therefore come to produce a conditioned response. But Edgar and Miller found that only one does. Only one develops the capacity to bring about a conditioned response, and it is CS1. The conclusion to be drawn from this phase of Egger and Miller's experimentation is that redundant predictors or redundant cues do not develop reinforcing properties. They do not develop the ability to bring about a conditioned response. In the terminology of Egger and Miller, CS1 gives the animal all the information he needs to know that the UCS is coming, and CS2 becomes redundant. It carries no useful information to the animal. According to these two theorists, 
When a cue is not informative, it simply does not develop reward properties. In a second phase of their experimentation, they carried the same kind of thinking one step further. In this case, CS1, which was the same CS1 as in the preceding experiment, was sometimes followed by the unconditioned stimulus and sometimes it was not. However, there was another conditioned stimulus that was always followed by the unconditioned stimulus. To summarize, in this phase of the experiment, CS1 may or may not be followed by the UCS or reward, but CS2 is always followed by the UCS or reward. With this arrangement, only CS2 develops reward capabilities or the tendency to elicit a conditioned response, and CS1 is totally ineffective. Egger and Miller explained these results the same as they did in the first experiment. They said that in this case, CS1 is an unreliable predictor of reward, and CS2 is, complete, is a completely reliable predictor of reward. So CS2 is more informative than CS1. Their general conclusion was that for a cue to take on the ability to elicit a conditioned response, it must be informative. That is, unless a cue, or CS, carries some useful information to the organism being conditioned, no conditioning occurs. Another recent development in classical conditioning is the area of semantic generalization. An example of semantic generalization would be if you took a human subject and arranged an apparatus so that it would deliver a mild shock whenever you wanted it to. Let's say, for example, that you show the number four to the subject, and while he is looking at it, he is shocked. The number four and the shock are paired a number of times. You know from our preceding discussion what happens under these circumstances. The four alone will come to elicit the same response as the one previously given to the shock. Let's say we're measuring reaction to the shock by using a galvanic skin response, which measures emotional excitement. The reaction to the shock would be a very large galvanic skin response. Eventually, the four alone would develop the capability of causing a galvanic skin response in the subject. An interesting thing happens after we have established this kind of conditioning. Let's say the conditioned response has been established and a galvanic skin response is given to the number four alone. Now we confront the subject with a large number of stimuli. Let's say that we read off a list of things like 17, 83, 105, but inserted throughout the list would be things like the square root of 16, 8 divided by 2, 2 times 2, 40 divided by 10, and so forth. What is found is that we get a galvanic skin response to all problems whose answer is 4, and we do not get a galvanic skin response to problems whose answer is not 4. Apparently, what has been conditioned is the response to 4 -ness. It seems that when problems are presented to the subject, like computing the square root of 16, he performs a mental operation or a mediational response, such as thinking or reasoning. As a result, when the subject is confronted with 40 divided by 10, or the square root of 16, and he experiences the answer, which is 4, that is what he has been conditioned to, and therefore he gives a galvanic skin response. The important thing here, the important departure from the traditional Pavlovian paradigm, is the fact that we are talking about meaning and mediational responses and not the absolute stimulus involved in training, which was the number four. Another even more complicated example is to take a human subject and to train him in the way described above. This time we will take the word right, R-I-G-H-T, and follow that word with a shock. Now the subject is confronted with a number of variations of that word along with a number of neutral words. Some words will be like correct, which is a synonym for right. Some will be homophones, like w-r-i-t-e, and some will be antonyms, like wrong. What has been found under, under these conditions is that what the conditioning generalizes to 
as a function of age. For example, young children generalize the conditioned response to homophones, words that sound the same as the one that they were originally conditioned on. Middle children generalize to antonyms, and older children generalize to synonyms. This has opened up a variety of research possibilities to explore further, and there has been a great deal of recent work in the area of semantic generalization. While we're on things of a cognitive nature that are related to classical conditioning, it would be interesting to relate the concept of generalization to the concept of symbolism. When we talked about Albert, we noted a variety of things would elicit the same response in Albert as long as they had something in common with the original conditioned stimulus. That finding doesn't need to be far before it enters the area of symbolism. After all, one thing can be a symbol for something else if it has something in common with it. Therefore, it seems possible that the idea of generalization and, and the stimulus generalization gradient could be used someday as a model for explaining symbolism. Recently in the Soviet Union, there has been a great deal of work done on the orientation reflex, which is the reflex of attending to a novel stimulus. If a stimulus, which is out of place, occurs in our environment, we, we reflexively orient toward it. If the unusual stimulus is found to be meaningless, there is very rapid habituation to it. That is, we stop, attend we stop attending to it. If it is found to be meaningful, that is, found to have some relevance to the organism, then the organism continues to attend to it. There has been a large amount of research in the Soviet Union and some in America on what conditions affect these orientation reflexes. For example, what kind of stimuli are attended to more so than others, and so forth. Pavlov recognized that there are some basic differences between humans and lower animals, although he felt that whatever characterized animal learning also characterized human learning. In other words, he believed that the conditioned reflex was as much part of the human makeup as it was the makeup of the so-called lower animals. But Pavlov noted that in addition to this basic conditioning, which he called the first signal system that we had, through the development of speech and language, a second signal system, that our lives were to a large extent governed and influenced by our language, which he called the second si signal system. This makes it more difficult to understand human behavior since we respond to signs, signals, and symbols rather than to physical reality. We are not, therefore, as directly influenced by the physical environment as the lower animals are. We become conditioned to signs and symbols in the same way as animals and even humans are conditioned to more physical stimuli. We are, in a sense, once removed from physical reality. Pavlov saw this as complicating the study of human behavior, and he also saw this as a possible source of danger for humans. He felt one should always be reminded that these signs and symbols are abstractions and they should not be mistaken for the real world. By distinguishing the first and second signal systems, Pavlov foresaw a number of research projects that are going on at the present time. By any measure, Pavlov was a great man and one who has radically changed man's thinking about man. That concludes our discussion of Ivan Pavlov.